Okay, have a look at this. This is one of my favorite monitors of all time. It's the 38WN95C from LG. 38 inch, ultra wide, love this. But check this out. I actually have to shimmy a little bit further off the desk so you can see the whole thing. This is a 49 inch super duper ultra wide. That's not the technical term, but it should be. So the question is, is it worth buying? But what makes this LG 49 WQ95C even more special is it's the first 49 inch 144 Hz super ultra wide to get an IPS panel instead of VA, which is more common. And that means on top of being a multitasking monster, this should have fantastic image quality and accurate colors for your creative work and also some very smooth, tasty looking gaming. But at 1300 pounds or $1,700, which seems like a lot for my American friends, uh, this is obviously very pricey. And the other issue is it doesn't get as bright as some of those VA alternatives, uh, which also impacts the HDR performance. Now, the idea with any ultra wide is to give you more desktop screen real estate, screen space. And obviously you get that with this. In terms of what's different between this and my outgoing 38 inch ultra wide is the 32 by nine aspect ratio means you've got two 27 inch quad HD effectively monitors side by side, but without a bezel in the middle. So this is like a seamless dual 27 inch quad HD setup, which is great if you wanna work with two apps in native quad HD res side by side. And of course those lack of bezels means this is even better for gaming and that wide field of view can be really immersive. Unless like in Overwatch 2, your games don't support 32 by nine. Then, like with TV and movies, or if you plug in a games console, you'll need to get used to some hefty black bars either side. But let's talk about the panel, and the 5120 by 1440p nano IPS display covers 98% of the DCI-P3 color gamut. We get FreeSync Premium Pro and G-Sync compatibility. There's also a built-in KVM switch. We get 10 watt stereo speakers, which actually sound pretty good. HDMI 2.1, which is great for your consoles, DisplayPort 1.4, which I'd use to hook up to my PC, and then we've also got USB-C with DisplayPort and 90 watt power delivery, which is what you're gonna to wanna to use if you're hooking up a laptop. And all with this fairly subtle 3800R curve. And I do mean subtle, compared to some of the other ultra wides we've seen recently, particularly from the likes of Samsung, you're not getting any of that kind of hyper distortion. This feels nice. But crucially, it is this IPS-ness that makes this unique. We've seen a whole bunch of VA ultrawides, uh, and until now, that's really been the only way to get uh, high-res, big ultrawides with high refresh and HDR as well. Uh, until now, it seems. I mean, as I say at the beginning, I will come back to it in a second, the compromise is lower brightness and therefore uh, less impressive HDR performance. But I would take an IPS panel over VA any day, particularly if you're doing any kind of color grading. But while LG's nano IPS display here is very nice, the downside compared to a VA panel is that we're not getting quite the same contrast ratio. And also unlike a lot of high-end VA ultra wides, there isn't any kind of mini LED backlighting here. So we do still have issues with blooming, IPS light bleed, and we're not seeing those sort of inky deeper blacks that you might get with a better backlighting system. Also remember that while this is a 5K by 2K resolution, that is essentially just a wider quad HD. And so if you're working with 4K content and need to watch it back natively, you can't on this. But dual quad HD is still more than sharp enough for this size. And of course, you're gonna get a higher frame rate in your games as well, which look incredible, by the way, at this size. Ooh. My only criticism really is that compared to some ultra wides like that other LG I've been used to using that have a uh, by 10 aspect ratio, a 21 by 10, I believe that is, uh, this 32 by nine is a little bit narrow. It feels a bit letterboxy. So in my ideal world, this would be a 32 by 10. I think that would make a big difference actually. But games can look fantastic on this thing. It's not the visual feast that you might get on the likes of the Samsung Odyssey Neo G9 with its mini LED 240 Hertz panel, but then this LG isn't really targeting the gaming audience as strongly, and it's also about 350 pounds cheaper. And there's something about those IPS colors and that massive sweeping size that makes the likes of Red Dead 2 or Flight Sim just look incredible. And of course, there's always an advantage playing competitive games with an extra wide field of view and seeing your enemies earlier. Remember though, that dual quad HD only has about 10% fewer pixels than 4K, so you're gonna need a pretty beefy PC playing games maxed out on this ultra wide monitor. <laughs> you have to admit, this does look a bit good. Although, what would be the first game you'd play on this if you had this in your setup right now? Let me know in the comments below.
Now on the far right at the back, we have this little joystick to control the on-screen display, which is easy enough to navigate, although I do feel like this joystick should maybe be in the center underneath. And there's plenty of picture presets, image and input controls, and also picture in picture and picture by picture modes, which lets you mix and match from different sources and different inputs. This is what a regular 16x9 video from YouTube looks like on this. You can see how much space you've got at the side. That might actually bother you if you're not continually using this in a sort of multitasking throw user way. Regular videos, <laughs> it's kind of funny actually. But going back to the screen, this LG covered 99% sRGB, 98% P3, and 86% of the Adobe RGB gamuts. And it's using an 8-bit plus FRC to get the 10-bit panel. So really serious video and graphics pros may be better off with a 4K true 10-bit model. Viewing angles are also a strong suit of an IPS panel over a VA, with color, brightness, and contrast staying consistent from pretty much any angle, which is important given how bloody wide this thing is. Okay, I admit this is a bit of a stupid place to put the joystick on the right hand side. It's a bit awkward, although thinking about it, one of the reasons they've done that in the past is so that if you actually wanna stack two of these on top of each other, which you might be able to do, then you can access the joystick on both without it being covered underneath. Now this is rated for display HDR 400, which basically means a minimum peak brightness of 400 nits, which is very average for any monitor these days, and especially at this price point. Now I measured a max peak brightness of 450 nits, which is plenty bright enough for day-to-day -day use, but less good if you plan on watching, editing, or playing HDR content. Also, HDR black levels are okay, but the relatively low contrast and the lack of any proper local dimming means it's certainly not as impressive as most VA panels, even ones costing hundreds less. And it's also no contest versus pricier mini LED or OLED options. Then we have the five millisecond response time, which is fast enough for everyday use. I didn't notice any blurriness with fast motion. The good news though, is that even cranking this to the fastest response time didn't produce much inverse ghosting. Input lag is around four milliseconds, which is nice and low, and adaptive sync with either G-Sync compatibility or FreeSync Premium Pro VRR helps to deal with stutter and tearing in your games. What does really help with the usability of this screen space though is having the Windows Snap tool or if you download something like Magnet on Mac, uh, which I would definitely recommend. You can you know, snap it either side, you can do it into quadrants, put that on the middle, that on the left, that on the right. Pretty usable triple screen setup, I would say. In terms of the design, this looks like any LG monitor really from the last few years, just a bit wider and some nice glossy edging around the sides. The Crescent stand base has a slimmer tapered design, but the rear is the same. It's smart and pretty understated. There isn't any kind of RGB going on here. So this would blend nicely into any office. Well, as much as any 49 inch ultra wide would blend in. There's also plenty of height adjustment. You can tilt it forward and backwards uh, and also Rotate, bashing my lamp there. I'm going to room on my desk. It does feel a little wobbly, and because you can rotate it a little bit like this, sometimes it's hard to get it exactly back to normal. You can see how wobbly that is. Feels a little bleh. Feels a little cheap sometimes. So let's wrap up. And for me, this is easily the best super ultra wide around for anyone who wants accurate colors. It's that simple, as most other super ultras have VA panels. Alternatively, if you want something this size, but don't want to spend this much, or there's something about this you don't like, you could check out the AOC Aegon Gaming 49 inch, which is a great dual quad HD 120 hertz option that comes in at around 900 pounds. Or if you're more into your gaming, then Samsung's Odyssey G9 or CRG9 gaming monitors are fantastic at just over a grand. Although maybe the best gaming super ultra wide, still the Odyssey Neo G9, which will set you back around 1700 pounds. But what do you think? Tempted by something like this or is it just a bit of a monstrosity? Let me know what you make of this 49 inch ultra wide in the comments below and also let me know what you're using at the moment as your desktop monitor. Thank you so much for watching guys. If you enjoyed this review then a like and subscribe would be very much appreciated and I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat.